September's Trauma of the Month session was a discussion about a patient with blunt polytrauma, evidence of traumatic shock and recess. And the evidence-based discussion following this case presentation was looking at the concept of permissive hypotension. So what is traumatic shock? Well, the definition for traumatic shock is that of a life-threatening acute circulatory failure resulting in inadequate oxygen delivery to the cells. And you'll note that there were no clinical parameters in this definition and that we should probably be avoiding defining shock by specific blood pressures, heart rates or clinical parameters. And it does make its diagnosis difficult. And we'll talk a little bit shortly about how we can diagnose traumatic shock. But firstly, what are the causes? Well, first and foremost, hemorrhagic shock is the commonest cause of traumatic shock. It's the cause of 40% of death after trauma and the leading preventable cause of death in tra trauma worldwide. And it's predominantly found in a number of organ systems such as external hemorrhage, that's clearly evident, hemorrhage into the chest cavity, abdomen, pelvis and lung bones, but also not to forget retroperitoneal bleeding and large degloving injuries in the obese patient, which can also be another cause of concealed hemorrhagic shock. Then we have obstructive shock, such as those in tension pneumothoraces and cardiac tamponade, slightly rarer in their presentation, but not to be forgotten. Distributive shock, such as in neurogenic uh, injuries, in trauma, and then finally cardiogenic shock. And I think we often forget about cardiogenic shock in trauma, uh, thinking of it more of a medical uh, etiology. However, patients, particularly with seat belt or steering wheel injuries to the sternum can have cardiac contusions, uh, commotio cordis, which is an, uh, essentially an R on T phenomenon with a blunt trauma to the chest. And also the concept of impact brain apnea. So the patient who sustained a head injury and has gone apneic from said head injury. And the evidence base suggests that they also have a massive catecholamine surge and so you have a stressed cardiovascular system that's hypertensive, tachycardic from a catecholamine surge and a progressive hypoxia from an apneic episode. And the combination of the two results in cardiac ischemia and stunning. And often these patients will have an isolated head injury and may not necessarily have anything on CT head scan, but will behave as though they've got cardiogenic failure in the short term. And these patients almost need to be managed like a medical case where perhaps chest compressions, fluid resuscitation, inotropy is the mainstay of management. But they can be very difficult to diagnose and certainly we need to be thinking about cardiogenic causes of shock in our trauma patients. And then finally, the silver trauma cohorts, the elderly patients on beta blockers and other cardiac medications with underlying cardiac pathology uh, complicate uh, trauma management. Certainly. So how do we diagnose traumatic shock? Well, as I mentioned, it can be difficult to diagnose um, and individual physiological parameters on their own probably aren't entirely overly helpful. So we need to be thinking about the mechanisms of injury first and foremost, and the kin the, or the kinematics of trauma. And in the case that was discussed during the session, we had a patient who'd come off their motorcycle at speed and therefore the potential for traumatic shock was recognised early before their arrival to hospital. Then we have physiological parameters such as heart rate, systolic blood pressure, mean arterial pressure, capillary refill, respiratory rate. And in combination, they can be very helpful in recognising a patient who's shocked um, but certainly in isolation, each one of these values for any particular patient 
um, isn't particularly helpful in its diagnosis. Then we have clinical parameters such as palpable pulses, whether or not the patient is perfusing their brain, so cerebration, uh, end organ function, so urine output, uh, and also localization. So, you know, the patient with external signs of hemorrhage or obviously fractured femurs or clinical signs of hemothoraxes or descended abdomen can make life a bit easier for traumatic shock diagnosis. And then finally, I just wanted to mention point of care testing. So point of care lactates and point of care of ultrasound scanning. And certainly point of care ultrasound scanning is becoming more common in the pre-hospital arena. Um, and it does add some value in the patient in extremis and resus who we can't get through the CT scan um, because of their deteriorating physiology. So how do we manage traumatic shock? Well, hemorrhage control uh, is the first thing we need to be focusing on, and that would be with diet pressure, elevation, the application of hemostatic agents such as c -Lox, early application of tourniquets in the exsanguinating extremity hemorrhage such as stab wounds to the arms, legs, uh, pelvic binder application to patients who have a potential for pelvic injury and clinical signs of traumatic shock. And also not to forget careful patient handling. So minimal movement of the patient, avoiding full log rolls, uh, utilisation of the scoop for transfer, and attention to detail for those patients who we're transferring to and from scan or theatre, doing so in a, a careful way, avoiding um, moving or uh, nudging the patient to avoid disruption of that early clot formation. Then we have damage control resuscitation. Now damage control resuscitation combines two concepts. It's hemostatic resuscitation which is a uh, conversation for another day and will be focused on another trauma of the month session. But there's also permissive hypotension which we're going to talk about in more detail shortly. And then finally, damage control surgery, which is, again is another discussion for another day. But that's a combination of hemorrhage control, surgical hemorrhage control, uh, decontamination, decompression of body cavities and stabilisation of uh, orthopaedic injuries. So what is permissive hypotension? So the definition is a process by which we maintain essential organ perfusion whilst avoiding clot disruption in the patient with ongoing uncontrolled hemorrhage. So we're accepting uh, abnormal physiological uh, parameters, so hypotension, in patients in an attempt to avoid disrupting a clot, worsen uncontrolled hemorrhage, but at the same time maintaining a physiology that will allow perfusion of essential organs such as our brain and our hearts. So the question is, well, what target should we be resuscitating to? Well, it's difficult because governing bodies that give clinical guidance uh, give contradicting information. So nice talk about maintaining a palpable central pulse. Um, so essentially, we're keeping the patient on the brink of traumatic cardiac arrest or low outflow, low outflow states. Um, and I think that can be difficult to do, and it certainly is uh, quite a scary thing to do. Um, the Joint Royal College of the Ambulance Liaison Committee or the Faculty of Prehospital Care are the kind of governing bodies that give guidance to pre-hospital clinicians, and they talk about uh, patients with penetrating trauma where we're aiming for systolics of 60s or cerebration, and that's kind of, in my head, in line with what NICE are recommending for all trauma, blunt and penetrating. And again, the faculty of personal care talk about patients with blunt trauma or penetrating trauma that isn't to the trunk, so to the limbs, for example, and they're aiming for systolics of 80s to 90s. But are specific physiological parameters such as systolics in their own right uh, accurate enough and reliable enough to target? Well, probably not. Um, 
Deacon et al. in 2000s showed that there was no correlation between a palpable pulse location and systolic blood pressure, uh, meaning that we often underestimated shock severity. And perhaps, therefore, we should be aiming for a combination of factors such as pulse, systolics, mean arterial pressures, whether or not the patient's celebrating, and that a holistic clinical picture is probably most helpful. And I think maybe perhaps celebration is is really important and we should be thinking about this more and focusing on this a bit more as it's a surrogate really for hemodynamic compensation. If a patient's perfusing their brain adequately to have a conversation with you, then, then they're perfusing one of their vital organs. Now, whether or not we should be undertaking permissive hypertension at all warrants further discussion. So let's have a look at some of the evidence base for it. So the evidence against permissive hypertension first and foremost. Well, Kishimoto et al. in Journal of Intensive Care Medicine back in 2017 uh, have demonstrated that trauma-induced coagulopathy is, is in part secondary to the initial tissue trauma, which we can't do anything about, but also reduced endothelial flow and therefore it does make you wonder whether or not uh, permissive hypertension in our patients is going to worsen their trauma-induced coagulopathy and that's certainly a possibility um, and given that we know that coagulopathy and trauma increases mortality fourfold then perhaps permissive hypertension will worsen mortality in our patients and we definitely know that there's been a relationship between blood pressure and traumatic brain injury mortality so for our brain injured patients you know, there's a linear relationship between systolic blood pressure and mortality, and we should be avoiding hypertension as much as possible in patients who have a predominant bone or head injury profile. And it's very difficult in our patients who have both brain injury and blunt polytrauma, and I think we need to decide um, what the predominant injury is. Um, in terms of how we're going to manage that patient. But how about some of the evidence for permissive hypertension? Well, there was some criticism um, on the original evidence base, um, which is the Bickle paper back in 1994. It was a single centre perspective RCT, and there were two, two patient groups. There were the pa These are all patients who had um, penetrating trauma only, um, and they were randomised into either resuscitation and back to a systolic of more than 100 or delaying resuscitation um, by giving them just 10 mils an hour ringer's lactate solution until he surgical hemorrhage control had been achieved and then uh, resuscitating back to normality. So this you know, essentially is a single centre RCT of penetrating trauma only um, and it did show a survival benefit but we have extrapolated the results of this into blunt and penetrating trauma cohorts um, and are following permissive hypertensive principles on the basis of this paper and that's where a lot of criticism from it arised. However, last year in SJ Trem there was a much larger meta-analysis of uh, permissive hypertension in blunt and penetrating trauma patients and this looked at three cohort studies and 21 RCTs and the meta-analysis um, had two patient groups. There was some heterogeneity between the papers, but essentially the patient groups were the hypertensive group, so MAPS of 40 to 60, seven, systolics of 70 to 80, so quite hypotensive. And then your control groups, which were resuscitated back to normality, essentially with MAPS of 60 to 80, 60 to 80 or systolics of 90 to 100. And the meta-analysis quite conclusively showed that Survivor was increased in the permissive hypertensive group with an odds ratio of 0.5. Um, there was a decrease in blood product use, a decrease in ARDS, and a decrease in multi-organ dysfunction. So pretty conclusive results, really. So perhaps permissive hypertension is the right thing for some of our patients in traumatic shock, keeping in mind what I said about the brain-injured patients and how hypertension does increase their their overall mortality. So what can we what can we agree on? Well, doing the basics well improves outcomes, and that's 
that's obvious. So we should be keeping our patients warm. So getting that bear hug on them as soon as possible as they come into recess. Uh, early hemorrhage control, so direct pressure, elevation, hemostatic applicants, application, pelvic binders for those at risk of a pelvic injury, and tourniquets in those with exsanguinating extremity injury. And we need to be thinking about clot handling, so being careful how we move our patients using scoops or trauma mats to transfer them off and on the CT scanner and transferring them to theatre or to and from the scan with um, as carefully as possible. And finally, I just wanted to mention TXA. Now, TXA is going to be the focus of another session um, coming soon, particularly with the Crash 3 results that have recently been released. But I just wanted to mention briefly about Crash 2. Um, so it's an RCT um, a few years ago now that showed transamic acid decreases the risk of all-cause mortality if given for three hours in a major trauma patient who has active bleeding or is at risk of bleeding. And the recent meta-analysis in the Lancet showed that actually the survival benefits from TXA do decreases by 10% for every 15 minute delay um, from the point of injury of giving TXA. So give TXA early, have a low threshold for giving it and uh, it saves lives. Thank you very much.